Um, thanks to those of you who have um, made it up early, made it here. I um, hope you've all had a good conference so far. Um, I'm delighted to be back. It's been five years since I was at uh, Agile India last um, and uh, had a great time then and, and really enjoying myself this time as well. Um, so, uh, as was just said, I'm James Stewart. Um, last time I was here, I'd recently uh, finished a position as deputy CTO of the UK government. Um, when doing that, uh, the, the thing that was sort of best known was some work on what was called gov.uk, which is the single website for UK government uh, information and services. Um, I led the tech team that, that built that and then went much deeper into government to transform our relationship with technology and digital services. Um, and these days, working at, at Public Digital, I, I get a delightfully diverse um, range of, of opportunities and things to get involved in. Um, so one of the most recent things is uh, just a couple of days ago, we published a paper around bringing digital um, practices, um, sort of agility, user-centered design, new technology architectures to bear on um, public financial management, the way that governments around the world think about and manage their money. Um, I absolutely love the diversity of the work that I get to do um, and the d different types of teams I get to work with. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, we, we work um, primarily with um, public sector and uh, large international institutions, but we also work with um, large private sector organizations that operate at scale and have a strong sense of public purpose. Um, and one of the things we do is we publish these short booklets um, with articles from people in our network. And slightly embarrassingly, I brought the French edition with me. So I have about 10 copies of the French edition of the latest one of these. If anybody reads French and would like a book, please come and see me because I really don't want to carry them home. Um, but uh, when, when Public Digital talks about digital, um, most people start out assuming that what we're talking about is, is particularly technology. And technology is a really important part of what we're talking about and the ways that we use it and, and the ways that it's developing. But for us uh, and in our work, we, we take a much broader view. So we tend to rely on this definition um, that when we're talking about digital, we're talking about cultures, we're talking about processes, operating models, and technologies. Um, that have emerged through what we refer to as the internet era. So kind of the last 30, 40 years um, of, of the development of, of many societies. And most importantly, we're talking about how do we harness those things in order to respond to people's raised expectations of the services that they have, the organizations they interact with, and so on. So all of our work is really about bringing these themes together, the culture, processes, operating models, and technologies. Um, and that's going to be a, a big part of the theme of what I'm talking about and how that comes together in, in the way we think about teams. But to get us started, um, I'd like you to cast your minds back three years. You might have been at Agile India. Um, I think it was running about three years ago this time. Personally, I was at home with what I think was COVID, um, but this was before the UK provided easy access to testing. So I've never had it confirmed that that was COVID, but I was off the back of quite a lot of travel, had a lot of what we now know were symptoms um, of it, um, and had just had to cancel a, a trip to Chicago in favor of hiding in the attic of my house and keeping away from my family. So it wasn't a great time. But I was pretty lucky compared to a lot of people around the world. Um, one of the, the many things that we saw early in the pandemic was a significant spike in the number of people who lost their jobs, um, who needed some sort of unemployment assistance. Uh, and this is, this is a picture from the Washington Post of you know, the first half of 2020, uh, showing the, the massive increase in the number of people in the USA applying for different types of unemployment assistance. And at the time, I was working with the state of California. Um, we'd helped set up their new digital services team uh, who were uh, doing a similar thing to what we'd done in the UK government of bringing together a lot of the information and services in a, in a single website um, and really orienting that around user needs rather than the structure of government. Um, but was watching very carefully as the, the California unemployment assistance system in common with many uh, around the US and around the world collapsed under the pressure of all the people applying um, for the services. It just wasn't designed for scale. It couldn't handle the sudden spike in people trying to access it. 
to their credit, the government of the state of California commissioned a report into what had happened, why they were struggling to scale this, and published the results of that. And that, that's quite a bold move to not only kind of admit internally that something's going wrong, but to go public and say, yes, the design of this service and this system is not what it should be. We need to explore that and we need to learn from it and we're going to do it transparently. So they commissioned um, Yolanda Richardson, who was running one of their big internal agencies that kind of coordinates the state government, um, and Jen Palka, who's a technologist, founded an organization called Code for America and had worked in the US federal government to explore what had happened. Um, and the, the, the report they published is, is really interesting reading. It's not that long. Um, it is reasonably technical about parts of their system, um, but tells quite a story of how a service like this unemployment assistance one evolves over time, and how people lose track of what the challenging parts of it are. So th they found, as they were looking, that the, the service could process about 2,400 um, uh, claims a day, um, but through that spike, they were hitting about 20,000. Now, in terms of transactions through an application, through a database, those are tiny numbers, but huge amounts of what was going on there would, was pushed into manual processing. Um, so identity verification, avoiding fraud, those sorts of things were all handled manually. And I can't remember the exact number, but it took something like 18 months to get one of those manual workers up to the point where they were really productive in the system. So scaling that part of it was incredibly hard. In order to make changes, you could apply some technology. You could shift parts of how the system worked, but you had to change your thinking about risk in order to do that. You had to change some of the underlying policies about how they made decisions within the system. It wasn't simply a case of scaling technology that would have solved their challenges. And as I was watching that, I was, in my mind, contrasting it with what was going on in the UK, close to home for me. Um, and this is a very similar kind of spike in demand for a service called Universal Credit, which is the UK's relatively new um, social security benefit program. Um, Universal Credit went through a very similar spike, but had none of those problems with processing claims. Um, in the UK, as, as anybody who's sort of a, a, doubt many of you pay that much attention to sort of UK domestic news headlines, but the debate was all about how much money should people get when they apply for this? How long should they have to wait before the first payment? And those kinds of social policy conversations and important political discussions, not can we, can we process people's claims? Can we get them on board with this service? That was a really important distinction and not one that we could take for granted. Because in 2013, the initial attempt to roll out this particular service was in a very bad way. Um, over 400 million pounds have been spent. You've been through five, the SROs are senior responsible owners. They're the most senior people responsible for a big program of work in the UK government. Um, nobody had successfully used it. Um, and so it was marked as black by a, one of the agencies that normally rates government projects in the UK from green, amber, red. Black means unimaginably, ba unimaginably bad, we need to stop this now. And so we had a, actually an opportunity, and an opportunity that we were able to use to lead to that position where seven years later, the service scaled pretty effortlessly. I say that, my colleagues who were working on it would not be happy with me saying effortlessly. They worked long hours. It's just from the outside, it was, all looked magically um, smooth. And one of the big contrasts was that in the first effort to build universal credit, they'd started with the simplest possible case. Single person, usually a man, living alone, no children, and, and designed around that and then worried about how do we scale the database transactions, how do we get enough hardware in place to run this, how do we, how do, we do all of that, which failed as soon as it hit the reality that almost nobody's life is as simple as that. And that just because somebody applies as a single person doesn't mean that they'll be single by the time they're receiving the benefit. Just because they don't have children doesn't mean they'll never have children. And the, the, the lives of the people using this are, are complex. I need to lean into that. So when uh, 
uh, a team that, um, so my, my organization in the center of government helped set up a new team that was able to take a new approach to this. And when we did that, we said, we're going to start by leaning into that reality of human lives. So rather than taking the simplest case, so we still need to start small somehow, because you never want to start big on something this complicated. But we're going to pick a postal code area, a, a sort of an, an area with a few thousand people living in it, which means probably about 100 people who are going to be eligible for this service. And we're going to understand their lives. And we're going to start them on a pilot version of this. And before we start encoding rules and technology, before we start building too much software, though we know we're going to have to eventually, because the only way to scale this is going to be to automate large parts of it, we're going to bring together a team. We're going to bring together a team who can not only understand what we might do with technology, who can not only design great user interfaces and run operations and do QA and all of that, we're going to bring together a team that includes people who normally provide face-to-face -face services to this population, who really know them and their lives. And we're going to bring together the policy people who, who write, have, have the ability to write and set some of the rules by which these decisions are made. And when somebody makes a claim through this service, when they, they register and we want to understand what they're eligible for, rather than have that software impose rules early, we're going to have a phone ring. And the phone is going to ring for somebody who can write the policy. And they're going to have to encounter the reality of the person who needs that claim and interpret the rules in real time for them, with them on the phone. That's immediately going to build empathy. It's going to make sure that we've understood that. And it's going to put that understanding in the hands not just of people who can design software, but people who can work out what are the parameters within which we can shape this policy so that we can make all of the other parts of this experience as good as we possibly can. And we started by going end to end with the service as well. So th this is roughly the steps that you go through. You create an account. You apply. Um, a big part of universal credit is about um, trying to help people get back into work. So you get a work coach. We allow for you to tell us over time about your change of circumstances. There's some evidence verification and some calculation. We went end to end. We put the whole of that together, not automated, but with a complete flow. And doing those things, understanding people's lives, building empathy, going end to end, meant that we were very quickly able to understand what actually is going to be involved in running this service. So when it came to dealing with an unforeseen global crisis that led to masses of new uh, traffic and demand for this service, the teams responsible who were working very closely together were used to working together. They were used to changing regularly. They really understood where the likely bottlenecks were in the service. And I've seen the text messages that members of that team were sending between each other going, oh, right, so if we can't see people face to face, these are some of the changes we're going to have to make practically, operationally, and these are some of the policy challenges we're going to have with that. And they just understood that, and they had that at their fingertips. And then with that, they knew the levers that could be pulled. They knew where have we got flexibility in the policy we've got, where do we need to go to the politicians to get some serious changes made? Where does our technology scale seamlessly? Where are we going to need new resources? Where are we going to need to re-architect parts of our system? Where are we going to have to take steps out of the journey short term in order to uh, make this work through this peak? And they understood the humans affected. They understood what proportion of their users relied on face-to-face -face channels, how many used the phone, how many were online and which ones could move and which ones were going to be challenged so that they could really think about the impact of any of the decisions that they made. By having all of those things together, and crucially, by having this team that was really multidisciplinary, that understood the face-to-face, -face, that understood the policy, that understood all of the issues in fraud detection, and was completely comfortable changing the technology, they were able to be prepared for the completely unforeseen. And for me, that's part of a wider trend that I'm seeing more and more with, with leading teams who are able to go beyond a lot of what we've talked about when we've talked about working multidisciplinary, where we, we sort of talk about 
DevOps, we really still mean the technology in that. We talk about DevSecOps, we talk about bringing design into that, but they're, they're thinking much more broadly um, and, and designing multi-channel services that meet people where they are. And um, when the California team um, published that report that I mentioned, my colleague Anna um, here, um, who had worked um, as a product manager on, on the Universal Credit Service, wrote a blog post um, where she drew out sort of seven reflections that she had from her experience working on one large scale benefit system and applying them to uh, what she was reading about California. And, and so seven points here, um, you can all read the blog post and we'll share the slides afterwards so you can get the link. Um, but there were three that really um, jumped out at me as, as part of the, the theme of what I want to explore today. The first one, that real change isn't just about technology. And I think we, we all kind of know this and we talk about it from time to time, but it's in work like this where that really becomes real. That for some of the users of some of these services, online services aren't always simpler or quicker to use for everyone. And this has really come home to me in my work over the last few years. As I've moved from the UK, where definitely not everybody can use online services, but most people can to working much more globally. We do a lot of work in Africa, in Latin America, in various parts of Asia, where the levels of internet penetration, the access to mobile, all of those things are, are quite different. Um, and you, you just can't make the same assumptions that you might in California. And that security must be embedded and not an afterthought. And that was actually the theme of one of my talks last time. I was at Agile India, I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. Um, but uh, it, it's just one example of one of those sorts of disciplines that often, you know, we talk a good game is left to the side when we're building our teams um, and, and needs to be brought in right at the heart. And I sort of interpreted those things in, in a couple of contexts. And one is just think about the way that the growth of the internet has happened, um, and particularly since kind of the mid-90s. We've seen this massive increase in use of, of the internet. People are much, much more familiar with using online services generally, despite what I just said about not everybody can access them. Um, and it, it's just sort of saturated our society. And along the way, people like those in this room have, have seen the emergence or, or growth um, and helped with it and stewarded it and, and developed it of, of things like open source, web standards, mobile, cloud, DevOps, continuous delivery, countless different programming languages, styles, and frameworks, and of course, all of the different parts of the Agile toolbox that we, we can draw on. What that means is that while we often kind of make lives, life a bit more complicated for ourselves than we should, um, and we're sort of pursuing the, the latest and, and greatest technology tools. Generally, if we want to make something with tech, the barrier to entry for that and the ability to adapt and scale have both changed and, and reduced enormously. We're just much better at that than we used to be. We've learned an awful lot about it. We have lots of resources that we can draw on. And once we do that, and, and add some of the agile and lean practices that we're talking about this week um, that allow us to move faster and or find the right direction better, we suddenly have all of this new capacity, all this new ability to do things that we couldn't do before. And we have choices about how we use that. And one of the choices is that we develop previously unimaginable services, ways of running businesses, and, and innovate in, in fantastic ways. And that's really exciting and really important, and we need to keep pushing things forward. But when I think about what I sometimes call agile dividends, the sort of the things that we've been, that we now have because of all of that development that we've done over the past few decades, I'm also really conscious of some other opportunities that we have. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a thinker called Clay Shirky. He was quite prominent a few years ago in the talk about the development of communication technologies and what it was doing to society. And he'd been very prominent kind of at the early bit of Web 2.0. Um, and, and he said that um, once technology gets boring, the social effects get interesting. What he kind of meant by boring was 
perhaps not changing quite so rapidly, getting a bit more familiar, and being everywhere. So he was particularly talking about, he, he studied Japan a lot, he was studying the, the US a lot, places where, where mobile adoption took off very, very quickly um, and was there, and looking at the different ways that people worked and interacted as a result of it. And that's often in the back of my mind when I think about what can we do with these, this new capacity we've got, with these new capabilities. Well, we can think socially. We can bring more people to the table. We can move away from thinking about purely online services and, and making huge progress with that to really thinking about how can we harness all of this that we've got to shift how do we provide services for people where they are, when they need them, how they need them, but much more efficiently or effectively because of the technology that we have on display and the ways of working as teams that we have. So how do we move from making exciting, fast-moving, but ultimately relatively exclusive services as technologists to bringing all of these people who have very different experiences of human reality together, informed by technology, able to harness technology, but designing services for humans? And that's easier said than done. And I was talking to somebody last night about um, my experiences in the UK government and was quite rightly asked, sort of, did anything go wrong? And a lot went wrong, you know, working at massive scale. I was there for six years, but uh, the team that we established is still there. Um, we worked on hundreds of services. We, we took four billion pounds out of the UK government's technology spending in three years. Um, and we, we transformed about 20 services in the first couple of years. And you don't do that stuff without a lot of things going wrong. Now, most of them quite small, but some of them quite big. Um, and we worked on one which was about um, agricultural subsidies and how do we support farmers where it went so wrong that there were parliamentary hearings. Um, my then boss was summoned in front of parliament to talk about why has this new service, which is giving billions of pounds out to farmers to support agriculture, not actually worked. Why has it been a lot of pain? Why are we lot very worried about whether farmers are going to get their money on time? There are lots of reasons for that particular failure. I'm not going to go into all of them here. Um, you know, because it was a parliamentary hearing, you can go and find the public records of that if you want. Um, but uh, one of the crucial things on, on reflection for me with that is that we had come in too strongly as the people who knew what we could do with new technology, who could build exciting new user interfaces, and who went and talked to farmers about what they needed, but hadn't taken the, the kind of operational and policy and political realities of what was going on sufficiently to on board. And I'm really pleased that more recently um, with our, our our consultancy were actually back working with that particular bit of the UK government, working very differently, bringing different teams together that, who can take that stuff seriously. But because we didn't take those things seriously and we didn't build the right team back then, we weren't able to deliver the new service. And that's, that was a big lesson learned quite painfully. Um, so now I'm, I'm pretty fixated on how do we bring these people together? How do we bring people who really understand those different aspects of reality into one team to work together? And that's easier said than done. Organizations generally are structured in ways that hold us back from the sort of collaboration that we need. Kind of large silos, power bases, um, communication structures that don't really allow for people to say, okay, here's a problem that we've got to solve. Who needs to be involved? How do we bring them together? How do we set up the right leadership structure and incentives? And fixing that's an art, not a science. There's no, no single um, solution to it, and everything is about the context, and it's about the people. Um, but I just wanted to share a few um, approaches that I've found really important in starting to crack that. And the first one is just being curious. And it, it's very easy when you're brought into a new situation and you're having to learn really fast to lean back on the things that you know well. I've been brought in here because I have this expertise. My job is to use that expertise to do the thing I'm good at. That's, that's a really natural 
um, response when you're under pressure and in a new situation. But if you lose curiosity about the circumstances you're in, about why, why has this organization got to the point that it's got to, what's important for it, what makes the people here tick, then you're likely to hit a lot of, of friction and, and challenges and, and miss part of the puzzle. Um, one of the organizations that we worked with um, in, in UK government is the Driving and Vehicle Licensing Agency. This is their beautiful building in Swansea in South Wales. Um, they process driving licenses and so on. When we went to work there, we found that the, the, the team we put together was, was really effective, and, and partly because they had this instinct to go and find the people who ran the phone call center and talk to them about what went on and understand kind of what works and what doesn't. Where, where are people phoning up for issues that should never have occurred in the first place? And use that as a way to understand what made the organization tick, what, what were the pressures on their users, what was the case for change, and who did they need to bring together to affect difference. Or, or this is um, Matt Edgar, um, who's um, brilliant. He is now working in, in the UK's National Health Service, but he was part of that team working on the Universal Credit Service. And um, you can see the look on his face looking at this incredibly dry policy specification document. Um, I mean, you could tell kind of how difficult that piece of work was gonna be when you just saw the piles of documentation about the policy design specification. That's never a good sign when you go into something. But, but Matt, somebody who gets enthusiastic about understanding what's underlying something like this and is really curious about what's, what's at the core of, of this thing? How can I understand it? And then how can I build connections with people? And applying that curiosity um, and that kind of determinism to just get under the skin of things um, has allowed him to be incredibly effective in, again, bringing people together from across disciplines. So being curious is, is the starting point. Next one, it, it's slightly harder to draw on examples for, um, but giving something up. And this is really a kind of political maneuver. Um, but again, often when you're in a large organization, um, there's a big pressure on you to prove your worth, to prove um, that you are the person or your team, and when we say your team in this case, it's kind of the people who do what you do are the ones who can really make a difference. But if you want to affect significant change, often you need to step back from that. So actually, how can I be the person who builds a coalition? How can I be the person who makes other people successful? And that requires a real level of confidence. Uh, sometimes it, it can be very challenging personally and politically. But if you're able to start doing that, then you can have a much deeper impact which is a bigger win for everybody overall. Like I said, it's hard to kind of draw on specific examples for this because so much of it is in subtle, sort of behind the scenes human communication um, and, 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 and people just kind of stepping back at the right moment or um, allowing themselves to kind of lose a battle because they know that it's in the greater good. Um, but one, one thing that came to mind as I was thinking about this particular lesson is, is some work that, this wasn't me, this was some of my colleagues did at a UK conglomerate called the Cooperative Group, um, working on their funeral care business. Which is a, you know, most of my examples have been public sector. This is actually a for-profit um, business, they're cooperatively owned, where they, they took the leadership through a process of, of setting out a set of outcomes that they wanted from a transformation they were un undertaking. And they came up with these six, um, almost everything focused on this first one, giving people time back to spend with clients. Because in the funeral care business, you're dealing with people at one of the most vulnerable points in their lives. And the last thing you want is for your trained professionals who are good at that kind of care to be spending all of their time working out where the, where the coffin is, where the car is, and all of those sorts of logistics. You want them to be helping the families that need help. And that meant stepping back from thinking about how can we produce something that will look really good as a sort of, this is how good our digital strategy is. We've got this amazing new online service, this great new app, or whatever, into how do we make those people who are dealing with families better able to do their jobs? And how do we make them the heroes of this?
And with that, I just talked about outcomes. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on sort of developing outcomes. So being really clear on the outcome of what you're trying to do is, is absolutely essential. Um, but it can be really common to develop a set of outcomes that are about the new thing that we want to create rather than the change that we want to see that brings everybody together. And a few months ago, I was working with an organization which uh, is an, in another one that um, gives money, in this case, for um, research and development grants. And they had undertaken a program of work to replace the underlying technology platform that uh, sort of processes claims, allows people to evaluate, is this a project that's worth investing in, and then tracks it. And they were having real trouble bringing the different parts of their organization together around that to the degree that they needed. And as I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, there's a certain amount of kind of modeling the existing organization that you can do when you're providing some new technology for something like this. But generally, you also need some change in the organization around how do we think about things, what do we standardize, where do we still allow divergence, and so on. And one of the things that we did with them um, was help them start to develop a, a service map. Uh, this, this picture isn't actually their service map. It's another one that I might come back to. Um, but to sort of say, the service that we're offering together is something that we offer together. The technology is just part of that. But actually, the other people who are deciding what sorts of funding do we give out, how are we making decisions about that, who are dealing with the academics and the businesses who are applying for funding are also part of the service. And mapping that together rather than purely having a map of the technology platform underneath it allowed them to start talking about, okay, what are the points that we want to make really efficient? What are the points where an, a human interaction will add more value? Started to bring them together to design that together. But we found that there was another problem, which was that they'd, they'd set out a great set of metrics when they wrote the business case for doing this piece of work. But because one of those metrics was replacing the legacy technology platform, that's all every, everybody focused on. So it was the one that the non-technical people were scared of and the technical people were heads down trying to do. And it was the one that everybody could solely place the emphasis on this particular group of people for. And nobody else needed to take responsibility for it. So we pulled out some of those metrics from their business case and just worked with them on, let's, let's surface more of them. Let's rebalance that and start talking about the more aspirational things that we're trying to do about reduction in administration time, and particularly externally. Make it easier for people to apply for this funding because then they can focus on the R&D that they're meant to be doing, not on how they fill in our forms. Um, and that then creates capacity to think more broadly about, is this working? How might we redirect our funding? How might we be more effective in what we're doing. But we're bringing those, those metrics out and really working a lot with the leadership of those organizations to say, you all need to stop just talking about one of your metrics, the binary one of have we switched this thing off, to, had we, have we had to renew the contract or not. Start talking about these. You can start to create an environment that brings your people together. And then with that, you needed an experimental kind of mindset to how you did parts of it. And I've started using the language of test and learn in these kinds of um, situations more than I use terms like agile. And um, I've, I've learned a lot of that from my, my colleague Lara, who's, who's very big on this, um, working with large organizations where too often the term agile well, we all know that it can apply very broadly, and we talk at events like this about business agility and, um, and, and, and uh, sort of shifts in, in business strategy that we can have as we become more agile. And a lot of organizations have become so focused on how do we do the IT um, and uh, a set of other baggage that, again, we'd all reject, but which is hard to get over. But sometimes bringing things back to something like test and learn just builds some new bridges. Uh, it helps people think a little bit differently, take some risks that they might not. Um, one of the places that we work is Madagascar, um, and this approach of, of testing and learning was applied when they were thinking about how do they make their tax system more efficient. And it's able to sort of move them from thinking about, as we think about making our tax system more efficient, how do we 
put big new pieces of infrastructure in place that will help us understand all of the data in the tax system, that will equip the frontline offices that collect taxes, because a lot of folks in, in Madagascar are a very long way from paying tax online. Um, so let's find some, but to an attitude of let's find something that helps us test how do we change people's attitude to paying tax? Can we collect things a bit more quickly? And can we start to understand wider change that we might do as a result? It's the start small thing that we talk about quite a lot uh, over again. Um, but in this case, they found, well, let's, let's just try figuring out, have we got enough data about the people who, who we need to collect tax from that we just start sending them reminders through SMS text messages? And, they were able to do that. You have to do some background work to kind of release that data and put it in the right place, which helps you start to understand the architecture that you've got and where you might need flexibility. But just doing that, they saw a massive increase um, in the collection of unpaid taxes. Taxes that people were happy to pay once they knew they needed to and were told how to. And that starts to instill, actually, okay, let's start something small. Let's see what we learn from it. Let's see how that directs what we do next. And in the universal credit service that I kind of started out with, this was deeply ingrained. And they really brought that to bear on how they thought about scaling what they were doing. So rather than having any kind of big targets about the numbers of users, the amounts of money paid out and so on, they kept bringing the what do we need to do next back to what do we need to learn next. So some of the examples of those sorts of questions are there. And, and, Answering the next question almost always involves going to a next level of scale. We're working with exponentially more local offices that support people. We have this number more claimants. We have this much more money going through so that we've got more useful data to understand the fraud risk. It, it, it drove scale, but it drove scale based on what they needed to learn. And putting it like this actually made a lot of the political conversations much simpler than if they'd started by saying, Okay, we have to do this organically, or we, we have to do this in a controlled way, which would make a lot of the politicians think, oh, you're scared of scaling this thing. They're saying, what's the next thing we need to learn? That's a, that's a conversation everybody can gather around. So at each point that, for that service, the decision to scale was made based on understanding what the next thing was to learn, and making sure everybody knew how do we need to um, explore that which parts of our operation are involved and leaning on the, the multidisciplinary team to say, okay, well, but if we're, if we're learning this, we might have this side effect. So actually, what's the bigger thing that we're learning? If we're, if we're learning this, does this lift this group of people behind? So how do we bring them with us? Um, it, it brought everyone together. And then my final kind of learning on this is about, I uh, struggle slightly with the phrasing of this, but, but working all the levels and starting where you can. I was really lucky in my work in the UK government and have been in a number of other engagements. We have very, very high level support for what we were doing. So the work we did in the UK and, and work we do say in, in Madagascar is sort of led by the top political leadership in those, or, in those countries. We've worked, a lot of our corporate work is driven at a kind of CEO, chairman kind of, of level. And that gives you a set of, of levers to make change, which are incredibly powerful. They're quite hard to wield because they can be, you know, you try and make a change at the very top of a very large organization and the unforeseen consequences of that can be large and the resistance in the system can be quite big. So you have to, have to work it carefully. Um, but, um, it's really exciting when you've got, say, President McCree of, of Argentina saying, I've got this vision, we're going to organize around it, I'm going to make that possible. But whether you've got that or not, you need to bring people together at a, a variety of levels. And often there's much more opportunity to start by bringing people together at a more junior working level, using the human connections that you have using the, the relationships and the conversations that you have with people day to day. Or using a crisis. Um, this is very rapidly, this sort of thing has become very cliched. Um, but, but being ready to find the moment when you can say, okay, now I need some people from 
a few different teams to get together because we really need to understand this problem together, understand its impacts together. Um, being ready can be the most powerful thing that you've got, which means being constantly on the alert. Hopefully we won't have another crisis quite like that one. Probably we will at some point. Um, but every organization goes through moments of pain and crisis and, and challenge. And, and knowing that you want to get people together, having a sense of who might be up for it, um, thinking about what that might do as an impact on what you're doing, means that you're in a position to seize those moments when they come. And also working together with people to start to kind of sketch out that when we think about what we're doing as an organization, how do the parts of this fit together? When I first saw this kind of, of, of mapping, I actually got quite nervous because I spent quite a lot of my life um, pulling people away from very top-down enterprise architecture approaches to, to driving transformation in organizations. I was like, oh no, we're doing that again. We're just doing it with a slightly different lens. But what I've come to realize is actually the sort of the, the sketching together of the different components of operating the service that we've got, where we think we might want to get to, remains an incredibly powerful exercise. Um, you need to obviously keep it fresh, say that this is going to change over time, call out your assumptions within it. But making sure that any of our pictures really have the humans they have for, as our users and customers, the humans as our colleagues who are providing other parts of the service in the mix, um, it, it brings people together. And then also seeking out the people who are already trying to affect change in different parts of an organization. So this is my colleague Amanda. Um, she uh, works on, on projects helping uh, large organizations think quite differently about how they manage their data um, and bringing very multidisciplinary teams together around um, what we call data as a service, but it's a kind of data stewardship kind of set of activities of really understanding what's the valuable data in our organization, who are the people who depend on it, how do we want to provide it to them, and, and what's the, the lifespan of it um, so that we can, we can manage it in different ways, treat it as, as products and services, not just sort of abstract stuff in a database. Um, what, what's made her work particularly effective is being able to find the people who are already kind of on that journey but needed collaboration, or needed top cover, or needed some other kinds of support that we could bring and harness. And most organizations of any scale have those people. So those are kind of five things that I've found work for me um, in, in bringing together um, deeply multidisciplinary teams across organizations. I feel enormously fortunate to have kind of lived through the past couple of decades of learning all that we've learned around technology. Um, but one of those big lessons for me has been that simply doing that without a sense of how do we bring more people into the conversation? How do we make sure that the things that we create are inclusive rather than exclusive? How do we build good conversations around what's now possible that doesn't throw away the learning of the past? Is, is vitally important to make sure that you know, we capitalize on all that we've got, um, but also a crucial part of making change stick in organizations, because it's only through building coalitions and bringing people together that we can really embed different mentality, approach, and opportunities into our organizations. So, thank you. Um, I think we have some time for a couple of questions. Hi, I have a question. Um, so one of the things that really stuck to me was when you said that real change does not always happen because of technology, but it's more to do with people. Um, so. One of the things that I wanted to ask was that, you know, you worked uh, with leaders, especially the top management, especially in the public sector, which is quite complex from my experience in India and other markets as well. So my question was that what have been your approach and strategy in um, getting them onboarded with this new way of working, looking at the right matrices, etc. So 
curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the get, getting people on board um, to get started is, is often one of the biggest challenges. Um, I've seen a few things at work. One is, is capturing moments of change, whether that comes from, in a political setting, it can be that there's been, a, been an election, there's been a change in, um, in, in political leadership, or just somebody's been kind of recently promoted and they want to make an impact, and you can kind of, you usually need some kind of existing relationship where you're able to approach them. Um, but you can then say, okay, here's our opportunity. If you want to make that impact relatively quickly, we can help you with that. Um, and if you can bring together people who've got a, a vision of, of what's possible, particularly what's possible quickly, with people who really understand the existing system so that you don't make unrealistic commitments, um, that can be really effective. So when we started our work in the UK government, it was just after an election. There'd been a change of the political party that was in control for the first time in 13 years. Um, so you had a new group of government ministers coming in. In that particular case, their goal was to save money for government. And we could definitely say we were the most expensive government in the world to run from a technology point of view. Um, and so they want to change that. Um, but we importantly had those of us like myself who came from the outside with kind of technology background and a different approach to doing things with well-established civil servants who were able to say, okay, the likely challenges are kind of how we approve spending, uh, how we do this kind of governance. You need to go and get to know these security people really quickly and really well and build confidence in them. So that, that comp sort of the, the being able to give some confidence to the political leader who was at a moment where they wanted change combined with understanding of the system kind of worked there. Um, Sometimes it's about uh, like the, the sort of grassroots communication strategy. So I've also seen in organizations where they don't have that top level support yet. Um, you'll often find top leaders are under huge pressure and feeling really embattled and they want some good news because most, most of life as a very senior leader is dealing with all the things that are going wrong. And Teams who've done something differently that's been successful even on a small scale who are good at talking about it can have a really big impact. So um, we spend a lot of time helping people just start blogs and do things like that where they can talk about what they've learned, um, talk about what they've done in a way that's very easy to share. And sometimes that's publicly, sometimes it's internally, there's sort of organizational dynamics to consider there. But the sort of actually being able to talk about small quick wins can add up um, quite rapidly. Um, and then there's something about sort of building coalitions. Um, so uh, I already talked about like you've got the internal people who know the system and the outside people who know it. But um, in a, a political environment, you're going to have you know, think tanks and you're going to have influential nonprofits. And you, uh, in, in the US, a lot of the change that happens in in digital services there is initially funded by nonprofits. And I think there's some of that going on here as well. Um, and uh, Viraj, who I'm doing a session with tomorrow, will be able to talk much more about the Indian um, context for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Well, I'll just repeat the kind of, if anybody reads French, I have some books. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, I didn't bring the English versions. Oh, that's another question. Maybe one last question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you please elaborate on give something up with an example? Like, what do you mean by giving something up? Thank you. Sure. So, um, thank you. It's that. Most, most organizations kind of set up the way that we provide incentives to people, the way we give people opportunities for promotion and so on, to be about kind of accumulating responsibility, accumulating power, being able to say very personally, this was my win. And that naturally divides people. And so in order to get a bigger success, in order to achieve something deeper and, and more sustainable, 
we often need to work against that way that our kind of organization's incentive structures work. Um, so that can be, and the, the simple examples are kind of the stepping back and saying, we, we did this together, but this person, this person over here, they were the most important person in it. Um, or sometimes it's the, it's the really let, sort of, for me, I've often found it much easier to tell other people to do that test and learn thing than to internalize it myself. It's, it's quite easy to say, you've got a proposed solution to this and I don't agree with it, so let's turn that into an experiment because I'm confident that the experiment will prove that I'm right. Um, and, and turning that round on myself um, can be quite difficult <laughs> um, because it has to bring quite a lot of humility in it, admitting that I may also be wrong. Um, but uh, applying that and, and being really open to, you know, the solution I came up with is probably just as flawed as what anybody else came up with. Um, there are lots of those kinds of um, dropping the, the uh, assumption that I'm the person who's going to solve this or taking the glory on your own from it, which can be really important. Um, and it requires a bit more of a longer term mindset because it generally is good for everybody involved because if you get a more successful service over time, that everybody benefits from that. Um, but you might not get quite the same quick kind of, I did this. Um, and the rewards that come with it that you might ordinarily be incentivized for. All right. Thanks a lot, James.